Good morning. Welcome to our online worship service this Sunday. Today is the second Sunday of Easter preparation or what we call Lent. Lent is considered an opportunity to examine ourselves and go deeper in our walk with God. It is a good time for personal reflection as we think through the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday when Jesus was arrested, crucified, and resurrected. Yet more than reflecting on the events, it is perhaps more fitting to reflect on who God is, His character, and reflect more on the heart and mind of God. Let me first read to you Psalm 57 verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. This verse ties in with our passage in Luke 13, as we shall see later. I have also titled this message, In the Shadow of Your Wings. The early verses of Luke 13 records the Lord's call to repentance, saying that everybody, without exception, need to repent. It also, it also has the parable of a, of a tree which is in danger of being cut down because it wasn't bearing fruit as it should. Being fruitful is the evidence or the natural result of one's repentance and faith. We also read about the incident of a synagogue ruler who angrily condemned Jesus for healing on the Sabbath a bent-over woman who has suffered for 18 years. This ruler was upset because Jesus healed or worked on the Sabbath. Jesus countered by saying healing is in fact best done on the Sabbath, representing the Lord's day when His presence and mercy is displayed by giving this woman her much-needed rest and deliverance from Satan's captivity. Healing and casting out evil spirits shows that the kingdom of God has broken into human history through the very person and ministry of Jesus. Jesus illustrates the kingdom of God as like a tree that is growing and expanding with its branches, filling the whole earth. Then Jesus tells the people to enter the narrow door of the kingdom. He reminds them that entering the kingdom of God is not by virtue of one's nationality or race, but by grace. This grace is offered freely by Jesus himself, who is the door. This door is narrow or difficult to enter into, if one is unwilling to give up false traditions, false doctrines, and erroneous ideas of who God is and His purposes. Our human understanding is often too small and limiting to completely grasp a divine, divine being who is far greater and, and far more awesome than what we can ever imagine Him to be. So it is in such false ideas that Jesus is calling upon His audience to repent and to instead openly receive God's grace and forgiveness. To repent is to believe in Him, in His message of the kingdom that has already come. Unless they believe, they face the certainty of God's judgment upon them. If they believe, they will have His loving provision and divine protection. As we go through our passage today, let it be that we learn more about Jesus, who He is and what He is up to. May it be that we can understand the mind and the heart of Jesus more clearly. Let us now read our passage today in Luke 13. During this hour of his ministry, Jesus was preoccupied with preaching, healing, and casting out demonic spirits in a region ruled by Herod when, verse 31, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. So right in the middle of his work, the Pharisees interrupted Jesus, instructing him to leave because Herod had been wanting to kill him. Was this an act of concern on the part of the Pharisees? We know that most Pharisees are antagonistic toward Jesus, yet there were also those who came to believe. 
It is likely true that Herod does not want Jesus in his ter territory because his popularity could lead the people to make Jesus their king. The Jews could rise in revolt against the Roman government, causing political trouble. Rome will not be very pleased with Herod if this happens. However, it's also possible that the Pharisees want Jesus to proceed to Jerusalem where they have more influence to control him. But whatever their reason may be, they sounded like they were concerned. Their warning implied that they seem to have some secret information that Jesus does not know. It sounds like they were after his safety and protection. Yet we can also sense that the Pharisees were essentially commanding Jesus to obey them and do what they bid him to do. Jesus' response was surprising. He rejected the control the Pharisees were trying to have over him. He was unconcerned about what the Pharisees were concerned about. Herod's threat didn't bother him at all. In fact, Jesus had little regard for Herod's position as a ruler. In verse 32, he said to them, Go and tell that fox. So we see that instead of the Pharisees telling him what to do, he instead told them what to do. Jesus asserts his authority over them. He not only has authority over diseases, over the interpretation of the meaning of the Sabbath, he has authority over all other authorities, be it demonic, religious, or political authority. Go tell that fox. He calls Herod a fox, which is a crafty and sinister animal. In Greek, the word fox is always feminine. It sounded like Jesus was not only belittling the authority of Herod as the ruler of the region, but maybe castrating him for being too weak to stand up against Herodias, his wife. You of, course remember, you, of course, remember Herodias as the one who orchestrated the beheading of John the Baptist. The Pharisees were wrong to believe that Herod had power over the life of Jesus. There is nothing under heaven or on earth that is not under the power and control of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus. Jesus continued, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. He is very clear about his mission to show the marvelous workings of God in their midst. He shows the kingdom of God has been advancing and defeating the works of the evil one with him, with Jesus being the central figure. His life's mission is to spread the seeds in the kingdom until it is finished. Notice he mentioned the third day, perhaps giving a hint and pointing his listeners to his coming resurrection. When we pause and think about all of the things that Jesus is saying and doing, he's, it seems like Jesus is doing and revealing so much in what he's doing and what, in what he says. He actually wants his listeners, even the Pharisees, to focus on him, on what the Holy Spirit has been powerfully doing and what his miracles are revealing about himself and God. When Jesus men mentioned, today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course, it shows that he has a very clear plan and timetable time, time table in finishing his task. No one can distract, deter, or defeat him from completing his mission. Neither can anyone dictate how, when, or where he should do his work. We can appreciate that Jesus' plan continues to unfold according to his perfect timing. That's who Jesus is. In verse 33, we read, Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that the prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. I must go my way shows that Jesus is taking his mission in a very specific direction that is according to his way and his purposes. He is well aware of his role as prophet 
and he can avoid the same fate as the other prophets of the past if he chooses to. Yet his way is to do exactly what his father wanted him to do, even if it means suffering terrible injustice and dying the most horrible death on the cross. Jesus will do whatever it takes to bring his work to completion. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been the center of worship and religious activities for the people of Israel. Pilgrims from everywhere visit Jerusalem to observe and participate in special annual festivals. Jerusalem is the center of government for Israel as well. Jerusalem means the city of peace. It is considered a holy city because that's where the temple of God is located. However, Jerusalem has become the very opposite of what it was meant to symbolize. It is neither a city of peace nor a city that is holy. Even though the nation of Israel takes great pride in their identity as the people of God, the nation as a whole turned their backs on Him. They mistreated, rejected, and murdered the prophets of God. The great irony is that they have come to reject the very person who has given them their identity as the people of God. Throughout their long history, God had pleaded continually with His people to come to Him, to trust Him for His blessing of protection and provision. Yet time and again, they chose to trust in their own selves instead, to determine their own lives as they see fit. Yet even when they chose to be unfaithful to God, God remained faithful to them. He never gave up on them. Verse 34 now. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Notice the calling of Jerusalem twice. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. When Jesus called the names of people twice, as what he called Moses, Martha, Simon, and Saul, it was to make them listen and pay careful attention to, to what he was about to say. In this case, the call also conveys deep emotion of affection and compassion. Jesus has a deep attachment to the city because Jerusalem is the city where God meets and is united with his people. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Sadly, when people turn away from God, they take on the very opposite identity of what they were meant to be. They became evil when they should have been a witness to others of what life under God looks like. Jesus plainly condemns their evil deeds. Then Jesus gave a vivid and very touching metaphor of a hen that gathers her chicks. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Yeah. The hen pictures Jesus himself, who longs to gather his people, calling them to come under him, to protect them from danger and harm. Yet, they didn't want to. Jesus was very concerned and disturbed at how people were totally unaware of the danger that surrounds it. We can sense the deep agony in the manner that Jesus described their unwillingness to come to him. The people had turned away from the very source of goodness and life and blessing that they so much need and seek after. He wants them to come under him so that they might have true abundance and true peace. Connecting this passage with chapter 19 of Luke, when Jesus was about to enter Jerusalem, we read, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace! 
but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He can foresee the grave cons consequences, the destruction and frightening suffering that was about to befall it. This is God's judgment on His people to wake them up from their spiritual sleep. Such destruction was unnecessary if only they would recognize who He was. The Lord, the Savior, the King who came to visit them at that time. Jesus wept because they simply would not. That's who Jesus is. Going back to our main passage in verse 35, we read, Behold, your house is forsaken. Jerusalem is God's house because the temple where God's presence dwells is located in the city. Notice, however, that here Jesus says, Your house. Your house, not my house. In verse 34, we also read, Your children. It seems like Jerusalem has separated itself from God. Jesus is making that apparent. And because it has distanced itself from God, it will be forsaken. The city that is the heart and the pride of the nation will be destroyed, deserted, and forsaken. Indeed, Jerusalem fell in AD 70 when the Romans crushed a Jewish rebellion and laid siege on the city, destroying the Holy Temple. Jerusalem truly was ruined and forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This verse may refer to Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday when people wanted him to be their king and political deliverer from Roman occupation. As he approached Jerusalem, they shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. However, another way to understand this verse is in the context of Jesus' prophetic return at his second coming. Jesus may be pointing to the future time when Israel will finally recognize and acknowledge who He is, that He is their Savior and King of Kings. So amidst the warnings, the agony, the unbelief, the rebellion and the destruction that will happen to the city, Jesus speaks of a time of hope and change of heart for the people of Israel. A time of redemption, a renewal, will come when Israel will know the heart of God, that He is merciful, loving, and compassionate. It will be a time when Israel will come to Him and be under the shadow of His wings. Not only Israel, but all of humanity. God will see to it that His faithfulness and love prevails in the end. This is who God is. We have seen in our passage how Jesus as the Son of God is very much in charge of His ministry and mission to redeem Israel and to reveal God's great love for them. He preached, established, and advanced the kingdom of God here on earth, defeating the powers of darkness. We also see how Jesus wants His audience, even the Pharisees, to acknowledge Him and acknowledge His works of healing as the works of God Himself through Him. He invites them to come to Him to repent of their self-righteousness and instead be covered by His grace and God's righteousness. The same invitation is being extended to all of us today. And so let me conclude by reading Psalm 36, verses 7 to 10. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. 
Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. This psalm reveals to us the heart of God. God's ultimate desire is to give us life, give us His light, and give us His love. All of these we find in Jesus. And now that we know who Jesus is, may we heed His call to come under the shadow of His wings.